Elbow Grease Productions in association with MichaelJacksonInsider.com presents We're talking about Michael being allegedly addicted to propofol and there's a doctor uh, his name is Neil Ratner who Reports say, and he says too, that he was Michael's doctor and he's an anesthesiologist and he traveled with Michael during the history tour in the mid-90s. But this doctor was a drug addict. He even uh, admits to falling asleep uh, or passing out in operating rooms while he had patients under anesthesiology. Now this Dr. Ratner did not ever explain why, uh, what kind of drugs he gave to Michael Jackson. So we don't know, but he said he was treating Michael's insomnia. So I'm imagining there might be another witness because that he, Dr. Ratner lives in New York and they said that their next witness uh, was coming from out of state and I don't know if that's him, that's just me guessing that he would seem like he would be a good witness to see if there was a, uh, you know, years of use of propofol and if Dr. Murray wasn't there every night I kind of wonder who was giving Michael the propofol if that was the only way he fell asleep or some nights he just stayed up all night I don't know I'm waiting for more information to come out um, now that now the the d defense did allude to two 911 calls and um, they asked Albert Alvarez, are you sure you only called 911 once? You sure you didn't talk to a Beverly Hills dispatcher? And he said no, and they just left it. So we're, that's, that's a cliffhanger for us. Um, also, um, there, I talked to uh, Mr. Flanagan, who is a defense attorney. And he, I asked him about the witnesses because I wanted to know who's coming. And he said that uh, the doctor coroner is coming. And that's, it's that doctor with that long name. And I think he had something to do with the O.J. Simpson case. Case, perhaps I think I read that somewhere and he's supposed to be coming but if the defense attorney told me that and that's the only witness the defense attorney told me about I wonder what his role is going to be in in all of this and and Flanagan also told me he didn't know who the prosecution uh, witnesses were, they don't tell them very much. And the only reason why I talked to the defense attorney instead of the prosecuting attorney because I had the opportunity. And that's why I talked to him. Now, Elisa Fleek, who is a coroner investigator, she's the one that goes and collects all the evidence. Um, you know, if you know how someone died because it was a, a, a 50 year old man without any wounds or anything like that, he shouldn't have died. So she went there um, after she went to UCLA on the 25th, and then she went to Carrollwood and she picked up you know bottles of medicine. Um, she did not pick up anything that had to do with anything IV because she thought it was just treating dehydration, it was saline bottles, and so she just didn't bother to pick them up. And, um, and I'm going to talk about the drugs that were found in Michael's house, but after I finish this. But anyway, she came back on the 29th and um, days later because then Dr. Murray was, uh, uh, the police had had a chance to interview Dr. Murray. And Dr. Murray uh, told them about more medicines that were in several bags in the closet. So she went there to get all these medicines. And there were 12 propofol bottles. And there were 10 other medications that were found in his house. But that would, anybody seeing all these lorazepans and, and hydroquinones and, you know, uh, Flomax and all these drugs would think that Michael was just this huge drug addict. But out of the 11 medications that they found in his house, and I wonder how many medications you have in your house. <laughs> you know, we all have medications, but out of the 11 medications found at the house, two were to treat his vitiligo, which were creams. Uh, three of them weren't even in Michael Jackson's body in the toxicology report. Uh, four of them uh, were in Michael Jackson's body, but they were uh, not used properly. Um, they had more pills uh, were left in the bottle than the, than the actual prescription said for intended use. So if it said take one a day for 10 days, all of the 10 wouldn't be gone in 10 days. So Michael was underusing a lot of those drugs. And then the Latocaine and the, uh, and the Propofol go used together to kind of numb the place and then to give the Propofol. So um, out of the 12 bottles of Propofol that were there, only one was empty. And 11 of them still had fluids in them. And they didn't, she, the, um, the uh, coroner investigation, uh, Lisa Fleek, did not know how much fluid were in all 12 of those. So I think that's something that's, that's coming later to find out if Dr. Murray was giving Michael a, a history of a lot of propofol or just 
have portions of propofol, but they need to elaborate on that more. Then the doctors at UCLA, they also said there was no sign of life with Michael Jackson whatsoever either. They said that they tried everything because Dr. Murray was telling them, uh, do whatever you can, please try to save him, don't give up on him. But they said they never got any signs of life. And I know there was a document that said that there were some signs of life at UCLA for about 30 minutes. They had good airflow or, or something like that. But they said, uh, Dr. Cooper and Dr. Wynn both said that there was was, uh, no signs of, uh, of life in that patient whatsoever. Uh, the Dr. Wynn, she was a cardiologist in training. So she was already an MD, a medical doctor, but she was doing her uh, fellowship to finish her last three years so that she could be a cardiologist. Now someone at UCLA did say that they felt a pulse. And, um, but no one, but none of the doctors said that they felt a pulse and they think Dr. Murray said he felt a pulse, but they couldn't recall who felt a pulse. Now, Dr. Murray did not tell anyone at this particular time, the whole day of the 25th that he was giving Michael propofol and it was like he was hiding it. He was hiding the drugs, putting them in Alberto Alvarez's hand as Alberto Alvarez, uh, reported putting him in his hand while he was giving Michael CPR and hand, you know, pressing his chest and handing Alberto the drugs to kind of hide. You know, so, you know, right now, Dr. Murray looks extremely guilty at this particular stage of this preliminary hearing. I don't know why, with all this evidence, he does not just cop a plea and hope for the best. Um, but, you know, the defense hasn't put on uh, their story yet, and I don't know if they're going to at this, at this stage of the game at this time. Now, they did mention some uh, surveillance cameras, and we've heard that there were surveillance cameras at the house. Now, they said that the police have some surveillance cameras, but they did not elaborate on what it was looking at. Alberto said he didn't do, uh, he wasn't in charge of the cameras. He didn't do that type of security. It was more logistics, preparing for Mr. Jackson to come and go. Um, so he said that there was one in the front and back and a couple other places, but the police supposedly have them, but we have no idea what's on these, uh, what's on these uh, cameras. Um, now, Geraldine Hughes did say something very interesting. She said that Joe wants this to be a federal investigation. Uh, with a federal investigation, um, I thought that was strange because I know that Joe was talking to the FBI in March and April of 2009 before Michael's death and he wanted to have Dr. Tomei and some other people investigated and wondering what was going on with Michael Jackson and what were these people doing to Michael Jackson. And I know for a fact he was instrumental in trying to find out what was going on with his son before the dreaded day of June 25th. Now, when Joe said it should be a federal investigation, we have to remember Marlon Jackson wearing the FBI hat. I mean, what is that all about? I mean, the day after Michael dies, Marlon and Randy are in a car. And then I suppose they went to the taping of Jackson Family Dynasty because Marlon has the same sweatsuit on and he has the FBI hat and they're practicing choreography, happy as can be. So I'm kind of confused. Did Marlon wear the same outfit another day? Um, and he just so happens to have that outfit on, you know, but why an FBI hat? I mean, these things are pre-planned. There's wardrobe people. Why did he have an FBI hat? And why was Joe talking to the FBI? And why now is Joe bringing up it should be a federal investigation? Hopefully we'll get to the answers to some of those things. So far, there is zero confirmation of any fingerprints, okay? The coroner investigation fleet, she said there was fingerprint dust on some of the bottles or some of the medicines, so she said that they were fingerprinted, but they have not talked about any identification of any fingerprints whatsoever. And we found out on May 20, on December 29th, which was the hearing before the preliminary hearing started, that they wanted to test um, fluids in one of the syringes and that they don't even know who the fingerprint is. And it's been a year and a half and they still haven't identified whose fingerprint was on the syringe. So I find that kind of, you know, kind of a loose end that needs to be tightened up. For now, there's still more witnesses, so we have to hold off on making any kind of conclusions at this particular time. Meanwhile, Dr. Murray, let me tell you what's happening in the actual courthouse. Dr. Murray is walking around the courthouse with no less than eight sheriffs, eight, eight deputies. I mean, two on the front, two on the back, two on the side, two on the side. I mean, once I saw him coming down an elevator, and it was Dr. Murray, and it was like six or eight you know, deputy sheriffs. 
But TMZ has caught Dr. Murray outside twice this week. Uh, once where he was going shopping at Nordstrom's with just one guy with him. Maybe it was a plain clothes security guard. I don't know. And then at another time, he's outside at the Santa Monica Promenade buying a little girl a balloon. Um, and he even answered the question, well, what do you think about Catherine? Dr. Murray said, I, I feel sorry for her grieving. I love Catherine like a mom. So, you know, all this is extremely strange. Uh, there were rumors that James Brown had introduced Michael, and this has nothing to do with the trial, the preliminary hearing. Uh, James Brown is the one that introduced Dr. Murray to Michael, but Tommy Lee, who was James Brown's ex-wife, what, whatever, ex-girlfriend, baby mama, she said that, no, that is not true, that James Brown did not introduce uh, uh, Michael to Dr. Murray, and that um, J Dr. Murray was not James Brown's doctor. So that's kind of out there. Mark Garagos on one of an interview did say something really interesting. He said that um, there's going to be a surprise, that the defense has a surprise. We don't know what that surprise is. Maybe they're going to discuss the amounts of propofol left in the other 11 bottles. I have no idea what it is, but I'm just needed a day or two, and that's why I'm doing this report tonight, Sunday night, so that uh, uh, I had a couple of days to really think about things. Now, um, I did interview an anesthesiologist, and it's very interesting what he said. Propofol is a hypnotic. It is a pure sleep drug. It has no pain-relieving qualities. That's right. He said that propofol is a pure sleep drug. Okay, so earlier reports when they said you're under anesthetic, the media, but you're not really sleeping, you're just out. Well, this anesthesiologist said that it is a pure sleep drug. Well, this is Pearl Jr., and uh, sorry to be so long-winded, um, but I want to make sure that I put in as much as I possibly could um, so that I could give you a, a, an accurate report with some of my own opinions on them. And I will be in the court every day next week, God willing, and I will do another report. But meanwhile, make sure you keep Michaeling. And all you fans out there, just remember... When we're bickering, death hoax, conspiracy, Dr. Maury's horrible, and we have all these different, differing opinions, just remember, we all love Michael Jackson. This is Pearl Jr. for MichaelJacksonInsider.com, and I'll see you next time. Thousands believed Tupac did it. Millions believed Elvis did it. But did Michael Jackson really do it? E-movie book, Suicide. Did Michael Jackson fake his death to save his life? By author Pearl Jr. It's the most shocking true story of our lifetime. Order yours today. Go to MichaelJacksonSuicide.com. That's MichaelJacksonSuicide.com. <laughs> anesthesiology. Now this Dr. Ratner did not ever explain why, uh, what kind of drugs he gave to Michael Jackson. So we don't know, but he said he was treating Michael's insomnia. So I'm imagining there might be another witness because that he, Dr. Ratner lives in New York and they said that their next witness uh, was coming from out of state. And I don't know if that's him, that's just me. Elbow Grease Productions in association with Mike. I'm guessing that he would seem like he would be a good witness to see if there was a, uh, you know, years of use of propofol. And if Dr. Murray wasn't there every night, I kind of wonder who was giving Michael the propofol, if that was the only way he fell asleep. Or some nights he just stayed up all night. I don't know. I'm waiting for more information to come out. Um, now, the, now the, the JacksonInsider.com presents... talking about Michael being allegedly addicted to propofol and there's a doctor uh, his name is Neil Ratner who 
reports say, and he says too, that he was Michael's doctor and he's an anesthesiologist and he traveled with Michael during the history tour in the mid 90s. But this doctor was a drug addict. He even uh, admits to falling asleep uh, or passing out in operating rooms while he had patients 